So um, I have to confess to you that uh, I helped uh, David put together the program and select the speakers, but I completely forgot that I was supposed to be speaking. <laughs> so I just uh, threw in uh, a few slides at the last minute, so please uh, bear with me. <laughs> no, I'm not that bad normally. <laughs> anyway, so um, I want to transition and start maybe taking you uh, a step back uh, to think um, about the uh, importance of all these methods that you've heard uh, f for the larger picture, uh, and in particular for the Brain Initiative. And this will be a transition to uh, Ned's, Natalie's talk. He's going to be addressing this directly. So why don't we understand how the brain works? And people say uh, normal uh, reason is that, oh, it's just too complicated. There's 85 billion neurons. Each of them is connected with 100,000 other neurons. It's just a complete mess. It's going to take us hundreds of years to figure that out. There are some people who even say that it will not be figured out. There are some people who say, no, this is just the brain. It's just too, too complicated. And humans using their own brain will never understand it. So my message is a little bit more um, positive, And it's to say that the reason we don't understand how the brain works has to do with the methods. We don't have the right methods. Why don't we have the right methods? Because neuroscientists have traditionally studied the brain with electrodes, recording the activity of single neurons and correlating that activity with the behavior of the animal or the mental state of the patient. Yet any part of the brain is composed of hundreds of thousands of millions of neurons. And in a way, they resemble the pixels in a TV screen. So try to imagine how you could try to watch a movie in a TV screen if you could only look at one pixel and compare that pixel on one TV screen playing one movie with another pixel from another TV screen playing maybe another movie. And this is essentially what we try, have been trying to do to the brain. So we need to develop methods that let us see the whole picture, see every single neuron, but see them all together. So this is an emergent property problem. We need to capture that emergent property. We do have methods that enable us to see the entire activity of the brain, like fMRI, and you've heard some other methods today, but they don't have enough resolution to see the single neuron. So a little bit like a bird's eye view of a TV screen. It's a little bit too far out. So um, we need to be able to record from every neuron in a neural circuit and catch every single spike from that. And you can try to do it with electrodes, but if you continue in that direction, you're going to make Swiss cheese out of the brain. So the uh, idea was uh, to generate, a, uh, to propose a large-scale project which we call the Brain Activity Map, and it was endorsed by the White House as the Brain Initiative, as a systematic uh, technology development platform like the Human Genome Project that could also last about 15 years, also with a multi-billion dollar investment, also an international effort, to develop methods to measure every spike in every neuron and to develop methods to uh, be able to manipulate and alter the activity of individual uh, neurons throughout the entire brain tissues. So the plan was to start simple with little animals like the worm and cut our teeth developing methods to do that job that are this extremely challenging job and eventually graduate to larger and larger prep, just like it happened with the human genome until we get to the mouse or maybe the human. And maybe not image the activity of every neuron in the human, but at least uh, every neuron in a piece of, a, uh, of cortex of an epileptic or schizophrenic, for example. So just to give you a little bit of a roadmap, so uh, we thought that maybe in five years we could map every spike from every neuron in circuits about 50,000 neurons. So that starts to be a small animals, invertebrates, some pieces of the, of the of, uh, mammalian uh, tissue like the retina, a ganglion cells in 10 years, a million neurons, in 15 years, uh, uh, entire brains behaving. How can we do that? So you've heard uh, one of these methods called calcium imaging. This is the best thing we have today, but it's not may not be the best one that we'll be using in the next 15 years, just like it happened in the Human Genome Project where the methods that were running at the beginning were not the ones that were used at the end. So in calcium imaging, uh, we found that you can actually use these calcium indicators that Roger Chan developed to stain neurons in a brain tissue and stain every neuron. And then we got lucky because every time the neuron fires an action potential here, there's an increase in intracellular free calcium that happens because neurons have calcium channels that open when they get depolarized. And that opening of calcium channels brings in calcium. You capture that with a fluorescent signal, and you make movies like this, in which, in this case, uh, it's 500 neurons in the life of uh, a little piece of primary visual cortex in a mouse. 
every gray dot uh, is a neuron, and whenever they're activated and fire action potential, you see them red. So we're not seeing the whole uh, screen yet. Uh, the primary visual cortex of a mouse has uh, 180,000 neurons, but at least we can see this corner of the screen, 500 neurons, and we can see every cell there. So that's really what's important, the systematicity of, of the job. No? So to image deep into uh, scattering tissue, uh, we couldn't do it with regular uh, one photon imaging, and it was, uh, I was lucky to work with Winfried Deck and Denk uh, when we were at the labs together, and we used these two photon lasers to image for the first time neurons deep in highly scattering media. These are examples of dendritic spines uh, of these neurons uh, in, uh, in about 100 microns below the surface of the brain. So armed with calcium imaging and two photon, now you can start going through different brains of different animals and try to catch every spike from every neuron. So uh, we're doing this uh, in the lab in a little invertebrate called Hydra, uh, which is in Idaria. And these animals have the simplest brains in evolution. Uh, so in a way, sort of, this is the simplest uh, thing you can try to reconstruct. And making transgenic animals that express genetically encoded indicators in every neuron, we can actually make movies like this one of the animal behaving while we capture every spike from every neuron. So this is the first animal we can see the whole TV screen. That's the good news. The bad news is that we cannot actually understand that uh, TV screen. We don't understand what's playing in the activity of all these neurons. And by understanding, I mean we don't have enough knowledge to be able to decipher the relation between the neuronal activity and the behavior and predict what the animal is going to do, or even better, figure out what the animal has done based on the activity of the, of the neural circuit. In a way, what we want to do is to read the mind of this animal, and that, uh, by this prediction, we'll be able to actually decode the neural code. You can imagine that neuroscience, at the end of the day, has to decipher a code written in spikes uh, in space and time and translate that code to the behavior of animals or the mental states of, of people. So uh, this experience can be done in, in mice, and this is an example of uh, two photon calcium imaging in a mouse. Uh, and these are the patterns that uh, we can capture in the primary visual cortex of this mouse uh, while the animal is looking at the video screen. So you can imagine that in your brains, uh, there's nothing more that patterns like this, except in this case, you're only looking at 120 neurons. In your brain, you have uh, 65 billion neurons. But if you could decipher this code, you'd be able to actually figure out what uh, is your behavioral state, what is your mental state, sort of to read your, your mind. Now, this has, uh, we've done this in 2D. To do this in three dimensions, we introduced uh, to, to photomicroscopy the use of spatial light modulator uh, in 2008. And with these holographic devices, as you've heard before, you can actually build arbitrary light patterns. So you can use these devices to write uh, with light patterns, like words, pictures, or 3D patterns where uh, you aim every beamlet to particular neurons. And using this uh, holographic uh, um, to photon stimulation, you can actually uh, with, um, build microscopes to achieve simultaneous imaging with two photon, uh, two photon imaging laser and manipulation with a two photon stimulation laser using the spatial light modulator. This is an example of the patterns that we project in X and C in the tissue. And uh, what we're doing with these patterns is uh, reading and writing activity in the brain of a way behaving mice. And what we found is something quite surprising, that when we stimulate neurons with two photon optogenetics to fire together, they bind together and they start to firing together spontaneously. So we imprint a pattern of activity onto the brain of that mouse. In fact, if we then stimulate one of the neurons that belong to the pattern that we have imprinted, we can actually trigger the whole group. This is something that's uh, known as pattern completion and is a well-known property of recurrent neural networks like the models that John Hopfield proposed in 1982. So this is telling us that the cortex works like a neural network and that these types of methods have the ability to change the pattern, uh, functional pattern of, of firing of these circuits. In fact, these changes appear to be permanent at least over a period of a few days. So now imagine what we're doing to the mouse. We're taking the mouse, we're using optogenetics in two photon with these holographic methods to change the pattern of firing. Now you can imagine uh, we could do this to humans, okay? And in fact, there are human patients like this uh, woman, this is from the work of our colleague John Donoghue, 
which is paralyzed and has an electrode uh, array implanted in her, her motor cortex. And using the spikes of these uh, few uh, electrodes, uh, together coupled to a brain-computer interface, she's moving this robotic arm that she has trained with her thoughts. So imagine that instead of, of having these few electrodes, uh, we could actually image the activity of thousands of neurons the way we can do this uh, in, in some animals, like in the mice, and then uh, use that, um, that information. And that information could be used in a beneficial way, for example, to move robotic arm and enable this, this person to have a normal life, or it could be used in a detrimental way to read out the, the intention of the, of the thoughts of the person to decipher the mind of people. If we're successful, we're trying to do this in Hydra today, Someone will try to do this in humans in the future. And also change the activity of, of uh, neural circuits in a way uh, like we're doing today in mice. So this raises the issue that we need a neuroethical set of guidelines for the development of these methods. That you may be engineers and you're building methods, but these methods are going to have, if you think about it carefully about the future, a great impact in mankind. They can be used to benefit mankind for the good of, of patients, they can be used to advance science to understand how the cortex works, but they can, the same methods can be used to alter the behavior of people, to manipulate the behavior of people, and to get into the, the deepest uh, privacies. So all these issues um, can be uh, raised already. Uh, questions such as the protection of humans, the identity, what is the, the meaning of an identity, because the brain is what generates your mind. So. Uh, I think we, we need to, as a group, uh, devise a series of guidelines for the protection of human subjects, just like uh, this is the Museum of the Historical Memory in Chile, in Santiago, and this is the, uh, the writing on the wall uh, is the, uh, the human rights. So we need something like that for uh, society to incorporate these novel neurotechnologies that are gonna have such a huge impact in the, in the, in the world. And uh, just to finish, um, Another th proposal uh, related to the brain initiative is to localize these new methods that are going to have such a strong impact in society in um, international or, or national labs that can uh, be shared by the whole community. So uh, it, we, we think very uh, strongly that these are the types of methodologies that are going to be uh, uh, going to, to change the game completely. They should be accessible to every investigator. And just like it's happened before in astronomy, and in physics, where you have these telescopes or the national apps with the beam lines and the particle accelerators, this is the type of technology that should be built together by the community and for the community. Thank you.